So how do we identify who those, which are those cancers and who are the patients with those cancers who are going to do best with particular therapies? And how do we identify what are the features that might need to be overcome in those patients who are not responding to allow some of the patients, more of the patients to respond? So this is work that was done by Dr. Tapali and Dr. Pardol's group at Johns Hopkins, where in melanoma, they identified that this PD-L1 expression that shuts off the immune response wasn't just happening anywhere in the tumor, but it happened really close to where there were lymphocytes in the tumor. So this was not a chance event, this was an event that was related to the lymphocytes trying to kill the tumor cells and clearly a defense mechanism. So that suggested that where the PDL1 was being expressed or in tumors where PDL1 is being expressed, that that might be a marker of tumors that might have the be sensitive to the immune cells that were there. And the initial data this looked great in the initial publication. Only the um, tumors that expressed PDL1 would respond to anti PD1 therapy. None of these 18 tumors that lacked PDL1 expression responded. So that suggested that that might be very good. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as good as more data came out. And this is a series of a lot of different studies with PD1. PDL1 antibodies, different tumors, different assays. One thing that was consistent, though, is that more tumors that were PDL1 positive, whatever assay is being used, responded than those that were PDL1 negative. But there were always, except in this initial study, some tumors that didn't express PDL1 that still responded. So we don't think we can use this as a marker to exclude patients from getting um, anti-PD-1. It may enrich for patients who are going to respond. And therefore, when we're doing clinical trials, we tend to, nor, and we're balancing between two arms of treatment, we tend to make sure they're balanced between PD-L1 expressing tumors and PD-L1 non-expressing tumors to make sure that we can interpret the result of the trial well. We can't exclude patients because of this. But maybe this is a way of identifying which types of tumors we should focus on treating. If there's a portion of the tumors that express PDL1, then maybe that's a, um, a population of patients that we should study with these therapies. And the initial data, this is also from Suzanne Tapalian, suggested that the only tumors in that initial study that responded were those that expressed PDL1 in some of the patients and in colorectal cancer or prostate cancer, which didn't seem to respond, none of those patients had PDL1 expression. So theoretically, you could go do a survey of all the different tumors, if they were collected in the right way and processed in the right way, and you had a standard assay to identify those tumors that have PDL1 expression, and those would be the ones that potentially could be responsive to. Um, immune therapy. So here's data also from uh, Janice Taub and uh, Dr. Tapalian and Pardol's group at Johns Hopkins, which suggested that in melanoma, um, you needed to have lymphocytes in order to have PDL1 expression. And however, you could have lymphocytes and not have PDL1 expression. So um, Till or lymphocytes within the tumor are necessary but not sufficient for PDL1 expression. So in melanoma, it looks like if you have PDL1, you're probably going to have lymphocytes there. But we don't know whether that's the case in other tumors because they could make PDL1 by other mechanisms. And so having PDL1 and lymphocytes there is what we really want. But there are also this group of tumors that have lymphocytes, but no PDL1 expression. And we wonder, are these the potentially PDL1 negative tumors that respond to immune therapy? 
Is it because there's something else that's shutting off the immune response or the lymphocyte infiltrate is not powerful enough to um, actually activate PDL1 on the surface of those tumors? So um, there are two mechanisms by which PDL1 could be expressed. One is through a mutation in the tumor, and there are certain pathways that can be activated and express PDL1 on the surface of the tumor without having an immune infiltrate there. And this happens in some tumors, such as brain tumors, and we don't know to what extent other tumors. While the pathway that we've been talking about that is, sets a tumor up to be responsive to immune therapy is PDL1 expression through that's induced by lymphocytes getting into the tumor, what we call adaptive resistance. And trying to sort out in tumors that have PDL1 expression which factor is involved can help us decide maybe which tumors are best to treat. And maybe it's important to have not just PDL1, but the lymphocytes there. And maybe it's the important thing is to see the lymphocytes there, because that's the driver of the PDL1 expression in the immune responsive tumors. So this is work done by Jim Ulay at the Moffitt Cancer Center, where they took a lot of tumors and they decided the way lymphocytes get there is by these various signals, which are called chemokines. And they studied a whole host, thousands of tumors, to see whether they could identify those that had uh, these chemokine signatures in them versus those that didn't. And they divided up fairly nicely for melanoma and other tumors into two groups. And the group that had the chemokine signature had a better prognosis, but they also had these small little lymph node structures, which if the pathologist looked hard enough in the tumor microenvironment, and these are immune cells organizing themselves to try to defeat the tumor. And these can be missed unless you're really looking for them. And only with this chemokine signature could pathologists actually go back and do enough slices to say, oh, there they are. So maybe this is what's really important, this chemokine signature to set up these type of lymph nodes. And if you're missing aspects of this signature, you don't have these micro lymph node structures within the tumor. So what are the tumors that express these, this chemokine signature? Um, these are a listing of the various tumor types. You can see melanoma, 20% of tumors have are in the 90th percentile of this particular signature expression. But a lot of other things that are here, including various head and neck cancers, bladder cancer, um, lung cancers, non-small cell lung cancers, um, cervical cancer, are also expressed as signature to a high degree. And they overlap in a high degree with the type of tumors that are responsive to immune therapy. So PDL1 expression, this type of chemokine signature are clues. But why are some of the tumors uh, with immune infiltrates not responsive to PD1 or PDL1 blockade? So it, it's possible that those tumors may express other inhibitory molecules. Um, and there's that whole list of immune checkpoints that could shut off the immune system. So it's possible for some tumors that what you need to block is not PD-1 interacting with PDL1, but other checkpoints such as LAG3 or TIM3. And therefore, we need research to sort that out for those other types of tumors. And fortunately, these other type of checkpoints, many of them are proteins that can be blocked by an antibody. So they're druggable. And some of these antibodies to these various targets are being developed and are entering clinical trials. And they may be the answer for tumors that have immune infiltrates but lack PDL1 expression for how we might want to treat them. So in putting that all together, this is a, a nice model that was uh, created by um, Mario Schnall of how you might divide um, tumor cells into different categories. 
based on PDL1 expression, which is B7H1, and TIL expression. So the PDL1 negative TIL negative tumors, this is a situation where we could call it immunologic ignorance, where the immune cell hasn't, the immune system hasn't recognized anything there for one reason or another. Unlikely that those are going to respond. This is the adaptive resistance model that has PDL1 and TIL in them. These are the tumors that we think will respond to, to a higher degree to PD1, PDL1 blockade. These are tumors that have TIL in them but have, don't have PDL1 expression. They may respond to um, another checkpoint inhibitor, or you may need to stimulate. Um, the immune system a little bit more to induce the PDL1 expression. So that's where you might need combination therapy, such as giving uh, ipilimumab together with PD1 or some immune cell agonist. And then there's these tumors that have no immune cells and PDL1 expression, which is through an intrinsic mechanism. And we don't know what happens to those, but without immune cells there, they're likely not to, going to be able to respond to immune therapy. So there are issues with PDL1 as a biomarker. It may be less relevant for combination therapies. So if you can uh, induce it with a drug such as ipilimumab or a cytokine, you may not be that important that it isn't there in the beginning. And because of this, um, the way to potentially identify combination partners to give with a um, a PD-1 or PD-1, PD-L1 antibody is to give something that might induce that immune inflammation, that it might induce PD-L1 expression in a preclinical model or in early clinical studies. So we're looking for those to be agents that we might be able to combine with a checkpoint inhibitor. And finally, and you'll hear more about this later, what the immune system recognizes, we know more about those antigens, and these are not Typically, these, prote uh, these mutations that you might hear about that drive tumors, such as BRAF mutations or EGFR mutations in lung cancer or v VHL mutations in kidney cancer, these are usually passenger mutations that just happen to be there because of damage to the tumor by either the sun or by cigarette smoking or by problems that tumors have in dividing in a normal way. And those tend to be the lead to the antigens that are recognized by the immune system. And therefore, tumors that have more mutations may be more likely to have antigens that can be recognized by the immune system. And therefore, it's not surprising that many of these tumors that respond to immune therapy, the lung cancers, the esophageal cancers, bladder cancers, are also the ones that are higher on the list in terms of various mutations. And just as data to suggest that this is the case, if you look at, uh, because mutations are caused by smoking, if you look at response to a PDL1 antibody in patients with lung cancer, it's more likely, you're more likely to respond if you were a smoker than if you had non small cell lung cancer and never smoked. And that's probably not because the smoking makes your immune system healthier, but because there's something that your immune system can recognize in that setting. So in summary, tumors that respond to immune therapy are more likely to have T-cell immune infiltrates, have adaptive expression of PD-L1 on their surface, have more mutations that serve as novel antigens for immune recognition, and therefore are more likely to have resulted from exposure to various exogenous mutagens like cigarettes or sun. And then the question is, so we, these are our clues, and this is something we're all working on, is can these various factors be combined into some type of model to identify tumors and individual patients that should receive either single agent or combination PD-1-based blocking immunotherapy, and what type of combination should we use? Thank you very much. Thank you.